Friday, everyone. Welcome to a Plusify's Fireside Chat with the National Association for Medical Educators, NAFME. I'm Vinu Deschetti. I'm the Director of Sales and Marketing for A-Plusify, and we are, are very happy to be Fontiva Certified Partners, uh, helping Fontiva clients make the most out of their Fontiva and Salesforce instance. Um, today, we are very excited to have Elizabeth Lasko and Byron Smith with us. Uh, they are going to have um, a, a little chat with us today about uh, their experience, their, uh, their journey um, through digital transformation for their association. Um, so some of those challenges, lessons learned and best practices. Um, this is meant to be an interactive conversation. So I'll be asking a few questions to Elizabeth and Byron. If you have questions, definitely feel free to put that in the chat or um, raise your hand and we'll get you on audio here and have you ask those questions directly. Um, we do want to start off, you know, when um, before I get into their introductions, one of the things that I know when we talk a lot with Fontiva clients or anyone going through any AMS implementation uh, or any updates or anything, sometimes it can seem uh, a bit daunting. And we get into these conversations about who's responsible for what and what needs to be done and some of the goals and objectives. And uh, one of the funniest things that came up in, in our conversations with NAFME um, reminded everybody of the skit from Abbott and Costello, who's on first. So while people are joining, I want to show you a small <laughs> clip just to kind of get us uh, a little chuckle in the morning, uh, in the morning, in the afternoon here before we start. Bear with me a quick second. I'll put that video on. second i don't know who's on third that's what i want to find out i want you to tell me the names of the fellows on the st louis I'm, team i'm telling you who's on first what's on second i don't know who's on third Do you know the fellows names yes well then who's playing first yes i mean the fellow's name on first base who the fellow playing first base for st louis who the guy on first base who is on first well what are you asking me for i'm not asking you i'm telling you who is on first i'm asking you who's on first that's the man's <laughs> name that's whose name yes well go ahead and tell me who the guy on first who the first base who is on first have you got a first baseman on first certainly side? then who's playing first absolutely when you pay off the first baseman every month who gets the money every dollar of it why not the man's entitled to it who is yes so who gets it why shouldn't he sometimes his wife comes down and collects it Who's wife? Yes. <laughs> After all, a man earns it. Who does? Absolutely. Well, all I'm trying to find out is what's the guy's name on first base? Oh, no, no. It? What is on second base? I'm not asking you who's on second. Who's on first? That's what I'm trying to find out. Well, don't change the players. I'm about. not changing nobody. What's the guy's name on first base? What's the guy's name on second base? So, I'm Elizabeth, is that a familiar kind first. of conversation that you've had throughout, <laughs> this, uh, throughout this process of of um, not only onboarding a new AMS uh, or integration, just but in general working with an AMS system and the many different hands that are in the pot. Certainly at times, Venu, it felt like that. Um, possibly uh, not as funny, <laughs> but <laughs> definitely there, was, there, there are some trying times. I'm sure a lot of people, and hello everybody, have, have been through this before. Um, and already know, but it is, um, it's never an easy process. And you sometimes don't know what you don't know until you're in the middle of it. That's, that's <laughs> a big takeaway. <laughs> well, before we get too far, let me do a little bit of introduction to, um, to the both of you. And while I go through the introductions, I'm going to uh, launch a poll here just to get a feel for where everybody's at in their, um, in their digital transformation journey uh, and how long you've been on Fontiva. So um, wh while I'm doing the introductions, please take the time to um, cast your experience um, and where you're at. Uh, Elizabeth Lasko is an association executive and communications professional working to advance the mission of the National Association for Music Education. Her work focuses on messaging and brand management, membership development, and public awareness campaigns. Previously, she held communications and marketing positions at nonprofits in the public safety and telecommunications industries. Mm -hmm. She holds a certified association executive designation from ASAE, 
and received her Bachelor of Arts in Piano Performance from University of Richmond, Virginia. Welcome, Elizabeth. Thank you. And Byron, are you with us, Byron? Byron Smith is the Director of Information Technology for NAFME. A, um, and Byron is responsible for enabling and supporting the business efforts for NAFME with tools and technology infrastructure that meets the business need. Byron is a member of ASAE and the Project Management Institute, PMI. Byron received his BS degree from University of Maryland and Univers at Uni uh, University College Park in Maryland and an MS and MBA from University of Maryland as well. Welcome, Byron. Uh, thank you. Great. Well, let's get, um, let's see here. Let's kick off with a, a, some basic membership structure questions, because I think that's, before we do anything with an AMS, that's where we're going to get our hands dirty. Um, Elizabeth, tell us a little bit about your membership structure. It's not as, um, as easy as it, um, as it may seem. <laughs> Could be, right. So, um, I, again, hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Um, I have worked at a few associations, and I would say that uh, NAFME, the National Association for Music Education, has the most complex that I have um, dealt with. We have um, individual members who are music teachers in schools. Uh, they are mostly K through 12, but we also have higher education. We also have collegiate members. Those are students at colleges who are studying to become music teachers. We have a high school honor society. So all that is just great. Plus corporate members, a few of those. And we have a wrinkle there that is 50 state chapters, 50, well, 53 altogether. And membership is reciprocal. You can't be a member of the national without being a member of the state and vice versa. Um, therefore, we have about 450 separate membership categories because of this reciprocal membership. And in addition to all of those, each person in that category, in those categories is, um, is eligible for a spousal membership if they're married to a fellow member, um, which gives them a discount. There is also life membership if they wanna pay for say 30 years of membership once they you know, get out of college. And um, <laughs> There is a, a retired level, which is also a discount. And so all of these different memberships have to be layered onto all of those memberships that are joint between state and national. That's so a lot of it, products. It, That's yep. a lot of if, ands, and buts. <laughs> exactly. And to top it off, if you want to be a member of more than one state, you can do that too. So say you live in Virginia and teach in Maryland, or maybe you have two schools and you want to be a member of both Maryland Music Educators Association and Virginia Music Educators Association, you can do that. Wow. <laughs> um, that might sound very familiar to many people that are joining us today. Uh, I don't think you're alone in having a complex structure. So Byron, that's going to make your job very interesting in designing um, an AMS system. Can you talk to us a little bit about some of those challenges and what you did to kind of overcome some of those? Yeah, so I think I think it kind of started with our previous system. Um, you know, very early on, I, when I came into the organization, I realized that um, we just had so many different um, ideas from so many different people about how the system should work, what it should deliver, um, what it was delivering well, what it wasn't. So I tried to take a holistic approach and look at um, what was the business need? You know, what, what do we need to get out of this system and what, um, what's working now and what's not working? Um, there were probably a lot more things that weren't working <laughs> at the time. So I tried to really focus on, you know, what we really needed and also, you know, tried to look forward and, and say, are we doing these things the best way? You know, are we, are our practices and, and patterns, are they the best to, that we can, that we can put together for, for what we're trying to accomplish? So, um, we, you know, we took a focus, uh, we, we just worked together. I mean, Elizabeth and I have kind of been tied to the hip since the beginning of this thing. And I think that's probably the most important, you know, aspect of what we've done. Um, 
And, you know, very early on, we realized that, you know, we were not going to be able to support um, our members and our constituents, which is like all these, all these folks in our affiliates that are in these uh, elevated positions, um, we're not going to be able to support them with the staff that we have. Right. Um, and, and so we're going to have to be very efficient and choose some tools and put some tools in place like a help desk system and a call center system. We got to put all that stuff in place so that we can support people and, you know, and, and, and we can um, deal with all the issues that are going to come out of this because it's not going to be issue free. Well, that's interesting you talk about the capacity. So maybe let's take a step back before uh, we get into even more. In terms of the organization, um, you were saying you worked with membership in other departments. What were some of the other departments? And technically, on, on the tech team, talk a little bit, Byron, a little bit how, what kind of resources you had internally to, to pull this off? That would be, that would be Byron. That would yeah. be our resource. Yeah. I, I, <laughs> wow. I had no internal resources, so all of our uh, all of our IT is is pretty much outsourced. So I have an MSP. I have like basically all my resources are vendors. So um, Did you start off that way. Did you have um, because I think that's very common in the association world where sure. you've got the the one person that owns the the AMS, and that person is responsible for not only the internal business processes and stakeholders, but, um, you know, you may not have the technical team staff to support your efforts. Um, but Byron, t tell us a little bit more about the other departments that had to be involved. So one of the, the probably the most involvement I've had is with, um, uh, not just with, with Elizabeth's team, uh, but with finance, you know, yeah. our, our accounting folks. I mean, that was a huge undertaking because we have, or had at the time, a legacy um, accounting system, and we we needed to actually bring that forward and modernize that at the same time. But we had to make some some decisions early on about you know which comes first, the chicken or the egg. So we decided to just move forward with the the uh, the AMS and then just kind of um, push back the the you know accounting system. But that also brought some complications in its own right because we had a lot of issues with tying the systems together, making sure we got the right information across between systems. So there was a lot of work with, um, with accounting. Um, the other folks in the organization, I mean, we're relatively small office. You know, we have a large membership, but we're a relatively small office. But I also worked with the program folks and, and you know, some of the other departments that had to do with, um, you know, uh, our store and some of the, the, you know, the merchandise we sell and how we ship things and how we determine whether or not we're going to take POs and checks and, you know, and all that kind of stuff. So it was, it was, you know, it was pretty much an all hands on deck thing. And I tried to, I just tried to involve as many people as possible. Anybody that would ever even minutely touch the system at any point um, or was impacted by it. Those are the folks that I involved. Can I add, um, Byron, uh, Byron's blocking some of this out because it was just so <laughs> stressful. <laughs> um, we actually, we had a, a terrible thing happen about a couple of months before we went live, our CFO passed away. And yeah. it was, um, you know, so in the midst of this, we were scrambling to deal with our loss and also, you know, put somebody new in the position who, you know, wasn't as familiar with us necessarily. And at the same time, we sold our building and moved. So Byron was responsible for moving the office. So wow. that's why we can't see him today because he's just. <laughs> just I, I, I don't look good right now. <laughs> There's just too much. <laughs> it has taken its toll. <laughs> uh, but somehow, you know, somehow he kept us on track and, and recognizing that we needed help. We did, you know, I think we, we um, you know, we, we reached out for additional resources because uh, we, we came to realize we weren't going to be able to, to do it on our own. Yeah. What uh, were both of you part of the selection process of choosing Fontiva? At what point did you, um, were you there? Because Elizabeth, I know that, well, fairly, fairly new, not now, but. <laughs> right. But, but yeah, I, yeah. I was not, it had already been chosen when I came on board. Okay. Yeah. And I, I was, I was from the beginning, I started out, um, I, I, you know, I gathered all the requirements that I could 
Um, I put together kind of an RFI. Um, I went out and looked at a number of different uh, systems um, and I tried to tried to figure out what was going to be best for us um, and what was going to address the, you know, the desires of, of, of the, the, the folks that were, um, you know, doling out the money. So, um, uh, you know, we came up with Fontiva and, you know, it's, it's been difficult. It's been, um, it's been a, you know, an interesting experience, but overall we have, we have visibility into areas right now that we've never had before. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're able to right. look at information in a completely different way and it is fundamentally changing, um, you know, how we do business. Oh, that's awesome. Now, Byron, through this process of working with different departments, is there anything you, you know, is there anything, a big takeaway that you had, um, whether it was a big aha moment, like this was awesome to do or something that uh, you wish you had done differently that you want to share with us? Oh, where should I start? Um, <laughs> I, I, I think, um, I think one of the biggest problems that you run into is, is the scope creep and, um, mm -hmm. just trying to please everyone. Yeah. And you really do have to button it down and try to figure out a way to get kind of the 80% or the 90% and then just let everybody know this is not going to happen this year. You know, we're going to have to follow on and do this later. Um, and, uh, you know, I think there were some, some areas where we made mistakes and we didn't do things that we should have done. Um, the biggest, the biggest thing, the biggest takeaway is, um, a, don't, um, don't force the time. Right. You know, that, don't we let, did not allow ourselves yeah, enough time. Yeah. Don't, don't let any specific group dictate, you know, how long you're going to need to, to do this. Because so what was that, that time frame? Can you walk us through from the time that you selected it? Uh, was the time frame to go live pre-planned before you selected your AMS? Yes. Kind of. I mean, yeah. What much. did that look like? Give us a, like months, years? Um, it was originally before we finished, you know, going through all of the, uh, before we finished, you know, I, get, I originally came up with a, with a timeline of about 18 months. OK, um, by the time we got that to the, work, yeah, that would have worked. It would have worked fine. Um, by the time we got to the complete with the selection process and we were going to contract, it shortened to about seven months. And right. there were some delays in completing the contract. So it actually shortened to about um, like four months, <laughs> four yeah, there five was months. There was a desire on the leadership uh, and, and among staff too to, to make the implementation not during the school year. So we only had a, you know, we had a window. And if we didn't make that window, it was going to, you know, move into a year later. And so we were pushing hard. We were pushing hard. Yeah. So that, that was probably the biggest takeaway that we have. And the other is, um, don't underestimate how messed up your data can be. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> um, you know, and, and this was something that was really difficult to communicate to our, um, you know, to other departments and other, and, and to leadership. Um, that was that, you know, for so long, our system had been, you know, duct taped so that it would work, you know, so that people could see what they felt like they wanted to see regardless of what the tr the reality was. So um, when we started trying to transfer all this data, there were so many inconsistencies that it took us a really long time to, um, to get the data in. And then once we got it in, we still had issues with, with integrity in some areas, you know, so um, that, that was, you know, that was a big, you know, kind of a big eye opener. Unfortunately, it was an eye opener that came up at the wrong time. It was way late in the process. And we were um, just, you know, it, it really hurt us in our implementation. I think things could have been a lot smoother if we would have, you know, anticipated that. I think Byron also some uh, th things that, you know, you just, you don't think about needing more time. I, I know I didn't really have a good perspective on how much time would be needed. We're working with a fantastic person from Fontiva 
but he wasn't on the, he wasn't part of the sales team. So we had to go in and sort of redo all that. Mm -hmm. um, as you said, scoping with, with our, with our a programmer. And I think he came back a little bit with, wow, that's more than I expected it ha to have to be. And everything kept getting delayed a little bit. And by the time we got to where we needed to launch, we weren't able to do any fine tuning, like on just simply how it looked, you know, I, I had, I think I had was expecting something that we could more easily make look better, snazzier, you know, more inviting and, and easier for people to read. There was no time to adjust that or push back on any of those kinds of decisions because we just, we hadn't let ourselves enough time. And, um, and then just things like how the, how certain aspects of the database were built were not what we were used to because it was Fontiva was a fundamentally different system and Byron can correct me on the technical stuff, but that entailed a much larger learning curve on our staff than perhaps we had expected. And we didn't leave ourselves enough time to implement solid training before we went live. And that made things very complicated when we went live. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was more problematic. I, it was just as pro problematic for, um, for uh, uh, membership as, as it was for accounting. Like accounting, it may have had, they may have had even more of a hard time because they were really busy trying to get ramped up and, you know, new people coming in yeah. and things like that. Yeah. And then, that really yeah, and then we had the end of year that came pretty much at the same time. Our fiscal year ended at the same time we were going live, which was another nightmare. Um, and um, they just didn't have the bandwidth to, to, to ingest everything they needed to ingest from, um, you know, from the instructional materials and the, and the sessions and things to be able to successfully move into being able to do things, sim simple things like um, just closing the month in books, you know, figuring out, you know, how many checks came in and, and balancing all that stuff. And it was, it was very rough for a long time because it just took so much, you know, it just took so much time to get people up to speed and 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 actually even create the new processes that we needed in order to handle the 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 new ways to to you know that we needed to use to to process memberships or sell merchandise so it, it was you know that those are i think primarily it's just time time was the big the big thing byron remember when um, one of the things it's just for an example for everybody um you know, we were, we kind of ran out of time, but we also did, this also was just sort of a misunderstanding between us and our programmer where we allowed the, the join renew process to go forward without that reciprocal relationship I talked about between the state and the national right, being right. solidified. Yep. And so people were able to check out without adding a state to their national. And we had, we had raised our hands about that, said we can't go forward with this. And our programmer felt that people just wouldn't do it because they would want the state. And I felt that that was probably true, but that people are in a hurry and they would just rush through it. And so we ended up with hundreds of people renewing without a state in yeah. that first month. And that took us six to nine months to rectify because we had to go back to each of these people and say, you need to pay us more money to complete your membership. And of course, none that. of them wanted to do that. They said, I've got a message here that says I've renewed. And so Fontiva had to go back in after the fact and fix that. And that was, you know, it was things like that, where if we'd had more time to test and make our case and explain why it, it needed to work a certain way, it would have stood us in good stead. I want to go back to the training um, bit of the conversation. What were some documents or what were things that you did to train? And, you know, after you started noticing that there were some gaps in, in, in just the training efforts, what are some of the things that you um, were doing and what are some of the things that you changed along the way to, to enhance and improve that training? Uh, I think a lot of it was uh, we had, uh, in fact, we just had another couple of sessions um, a couple of weeks ago. We had Fontiva actually come in and um, 
for instance, for uh, for accounting, we had there an accounting specialist, um, and she's really good. And she came in and she, you know, together with our business analyst, put together like a, do a documentation package that's just for accounting. That's all it's for. And she walked them through it, um, walked through all their scenarios. I put together a bunch of scenarios to help her kind of tailor her training. Um, I did the same thing for, uh, for the membership side, except uh, Betty, um, our membership manager, she, she was really heavily involved in that, making sure that um, all the questions were answered that they had. Um, we, we tried to put together documentation, but it's hard. So you have to, you got to really focus on it and, and have, you know, I think if you have enough people or somebody that's responsible, this person's responsible for documentation, you know, and, and you have someone putting all the documentation in a, in a consolidated place. I think that's probably a lesson learned that, you know, that I, I, you know, take away from this experience. Um, but essentially what we did is we, we kind of, we kind of, uh, you know, made it up as we went along and wherever we had a need, we had, we felt we had a need where we were like making mistakes. Um, you know, with, for instance, a good, here's a good example. So, um, Fontiva has this and they've recently changed this, but they have this idea of like sales orders and invoices and, and we were using yeah. sales orders and, and, you know, for everything. And, um, we had some instances where we, we were taking purchase orders and checks and we were shipping things and activating, you know, memberships and we didn't want to activate memberships if they hadn't paid yet or, you know, so we needed to really come up with a better way instead of kind of working around the whole invoice sales order thing. We had to work, we had to create a way to create, to make sure we created invoices for some things and sales orders only for other things. Um, and so, so that we wouldn't like, for instance, activate a membership, um, right. you know, before yeah. the person had paid it. Uh, so that was a huge learning curve. And it was something that if we would have better understood what we needed, I think it would have, it, it would have helped us like kind of come up with those kind of um, training sessions earlier. And I think some of it is, you know, you get into this and you're used to doing it a certain, doing everything a certain way, the way you've always done it. And, you know, Elizabeth can tell you, that's like one of the things I hate to hear the most. Mm -hmm. when say that. Well, that's the way we've always done it. Um, say it all the time. <laughs> yeah. But, but um, it's, it's, it can really kill you because you, it kind of closes your mind to thinking about different ways of doing things sometimes. So we, you know, we've kind of worked through it and um, we're a lot better off today. Like, like for instance, we today, like unlike before, we can like, do a report and figure out how much money people owe us, right. you know, and, and we couldn't do that before. It wasn't easy. We could do it, but it was, it was not easy. So before you guys were using two different systems to manage the, the membership and the, the payments. So now you're able to see all of that within Fontiva, right? Yeah. So before the, 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 well, the payments and everything were coming through the same system, but it just handled them differently. It handled everything as if it was an invoice but it didn't really give you a good idea of the difference between somebody that owed you money for merchandise versus somebody that owed you money for a membership that was not yet, um, you know, that wasn't yet processed. Now so, for that type of insight, was that something that came with, is it Fontiva, you know, is, is kind of the reports and dashboards that you automatically get from Fontiva or was there some customization that needed to be done to, to, to get you what you needed? Um, I think, I think everybody has, um, has their own kind of sets of the way they want to visualize data. So I would say we did have to have a little bit of customization on, on some of the reports. Um, and typically what happens today is we get, you know, certain, um, like one of our constituents, for example, um, uh, they, they had some specific needs, you know, like yeah. information that they wanted to see that nobody else really cares about. I wouldn't say they didn't care about it, but they just don't need it in that way. And they needed it to be in a certain order and the columns had to be a certain order and all this stuff. So we did have to do like some custom reports for that, you know, for that use. Um, but for the most part, a lot of the reports we have are the same reports that 
um, you know, they would, the, the, the actual report definitions were already there. They're, you know, they're just, uh, and we just, just did variations of them and just, you know, added columns and removed columns and changed filters. So a lot of stuff is already there. Mayor Roth has a really good question that I think kind of goes to the process uh, discussion in terms of did what did uh, Fontiva uh, provide you in terms of best practices uh, in terms of processes within Fontiva um, and how did that translate to changing did you need to change your internal business processes for that so let me say something before uh, before Byron just to I mean, I think every association is different. Um, a lot of the people who had been involved at, in this integration in the membership side had, had been there, or at least a few, at the, at the previous one that we did in 2012, I think. Um, they were expecting more hands-on training. Yeah. And um, I don't want to, I don't want to misspeak, but we, we really got the impression that Fontiva was not going to provide that that they really wanted us to look at manuals and um, go watch videos. And yep. those things were helpful, but we weren't at a place where we could do that. We, we had to insist on hands-on training and in-person training and that, and they, they came through with that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, perfect. Um, yeah. They, they, you know, we, we, um, what was, I'm sorry, what was the question? Because it was a specific question. Just about best practice processes. Practice. What, what did they yeah. provide us with? So there wasn't as much best practice as there was um, best practice for you. And a lot yeah. of it was, you know, they, they, they emphasized more, well, it depends on what you guys want to do. And so in that, from that perspective, we were a little misguided because we, we only thought about it from the perspective of how we always did it. And so we just didn't have an idea of the best way to do it, you know? That's absolutely so, true. Yes. Yeah. And that, that was kind of one of the things that looking back, I wish we could have gotten. It wasn't that Fontiva wasn't offering us help because they, I mean, they, they were, they stepped outside the box every time we, <laughs> every time we yeah. get out, it's like, we, we don't know what we're doing. We don't, you know, we need help. And they, they really, um, you know, they really pulled out all the stops to get us the help we needed. Um, and remember, we had those 53 state people, uh, you know, managers of those states who were also asking for things. So it was not just inside the staff. So there, I mean, it was a, it was a tall bill to fill to think that there would be any best practices that could fit, as you said, all the boxes. Right. So we have partner portals for every one of those, those, those states and those affiliates. And I had to come up with the documentation and, and what we should allow them to use and what we shouldn't allow them to use. And really it's based on, you know, what, what do you want to allow people to do in this system? Cause it has a lot, there's a lot to it. There's probably a lot in there that we're not even using, but um, you know, it's, it's, um, it's really up to you how, what you want to get out of the system. Mm -hmm. I think Mary Roth feels your pain. She's talking about she has 80 chapters. 80. Yeah, I don't want to even hear that number 80. <laughs> yeah, that, that's, not, that's not nice. <laughs> <laughs> well, I will say, you know, from a provider, a vendor standpoint, um, we've worked with over 20 Fontiva clients, and we have actually created this internal task force that meets on a regular basis to talk about what's going on with all of our association clients that are using Fontiva. And what are some of the things that we can recommend that can make processes better, easier, and across the board? And there were, the de developers are sharing that information so that they can talk to um, the different Fontiva clients and say, you know, we've seen this problem. It's not, um, or, you know, this business process is not working for you, but we've seen this work in a, in a different way for another organization. Give this a try out. So I know that looking to other providers, uh, suppliers to, um, to give that input because we're getting our hands dirty and we can look beyond your organization and bring that to the table. Um, I do also wanna talk a little bit about the data cleanup. Okay, so you, you have the data issue and uh, at least you identified what the problems were, you fixed it. What are some of the things you've put into place today to make sure you don't end up where you were? when you when you launched well that duplicate um record alert that fontiva has has helped us a lot it uh, uh, our biggest well 
again, Byron, correct me if I'm wrong, from my perspective in membership, one of the biggest issues with the data was duplicate records because people were always, rather than renewing, they would start a new membership. You know, they, so they would end up with two or three or they would go away for a while and they'd rejoin and they'd have a different email address, but they were really the same person as somebody else or as they had been before. So we tried to go through in, in, the, in the six months while we were building the system, we literally had temporary assistants come in and go through these lists of state uh, uh, memberships and try to eliminate the duplicates. And now we're just trying to implement, again, in this small area, a, a best practice of, mm. you know, and a Plusify obviously is helping us with this. You know, when you take a membership, the first thing you do is look for a possible previous membership and try to combine them or merge them and just don't, don't end up with these additional extra memberships on the rolls. Um, it's also, I think the login process that, that Fontiva has, has, has made it um, less likely to, to create uh, duplicates, but we're, we're always going to have them because if it, anytime somebody changes their email address, they can, you know, create a new contact record. So, um, but we are trying to be more vigilant, also working with our states, asking them to review their data more closely every month. We depend on them. They know the people in their state. And uh, so those are some of the things we've tried to implement um, in that way. But with 60,000 plus records, active records at any time, it's, uh, and I think we have 250,000 in the database, um, you know, it's, it's certainly hard to find them all. Uh, another quick example is this, this yesterday I was over um, reviewing the list for our monthly membership renewals, and I just looked at it for duplicates um, to see if I could, could get rid of it. And, and you find a few things like somebody ha has a membership that should have been suspended, but it, but it isn't. It's pretty laborious. Um, but from the membership record standpoint, that's um, just cleaning it up before we went live was very important. Um, one of the things that, uh, that actually came up during the implementation was the need for a full sandbox. Ah, yes, that was critical. Yeah, so the way that you implement Fontiva, you have to transfer your data into it and you have to transfer it in in pieces and it's just inter it's kind of interrelated files of, of different pieces of, of all your records. And so uh, we right away ran into an issue where um, it wasn't scoped for us to have this, this full sandbox, yet the partial sandbox just doesn't have enough space to host all of your records. Um, it may for some, but for us, it just did not. We had way too many records. So um, we had to, like in the middle of the, of the migration, we had to get this, this full sandbox. Um, and it was extremely useful because it allows you to just put, throw in all of your data um, uh, and, 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 and it gives you the ability to kind of, you know, run some what if scenarios, what if we try this or what if we try that and, and, and you know, did this actually work? Um, the partial sandbox didn't allow us to do that as much. Now that we've gotten into it, we are able to kind of move back to the partial sandbox and do most things in the partial sandbox. But, um, you know, that, that is something that you should definitely take into account when you're, you know, when you're getting into uh, Fontiva, like whether or not you want to go, you know, go with the full sandbox. Because I, I would recommend people do. Um, it's, 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 it can be expensive, but I think it's, it's worth it as far as, you know, getting your, uh, getting your data worked through. I got another question here for you. Let's move um, beyond data and let's get into maybe some of the features. Um, there's, you know, obviously reasons why you chose Fontiva um, and for some of its features. What are some of the features that you're using now that that has really rocked rocked the association's world? <laughs> uh, so one of the things that I do notice that Fontiva does a lot is they, they talk a lot about their um, events. We have not used the events. So yeah, we, we haven't been able to get there. Yeah, we haven't been able to get there. So we can't give you anything on that. Is that uh, on the horizon? Is that something that'll be coming up that you're thinking about? I don't know. Um, I, I think, I think with, with respect to events, 
especially given COVID, we've had kind of a whole new look It's a different at, world. Yeah, it's right. a whole different world. And um, we already had a, a really good event um, package that we were using that was really working well for us. Um, previously, we did have an event. We had an events module in our previous AMS, and it was, you know, it just got to be a nightmare. You know, every time there was a problem with the AMS, there was a problem with the events package, and events is the, kind of the lifeblood of a lot of our affiliates and stuff, and, and, and it, was, it was just really bad. So that's when we kind of made that departure and split those apart. However, um, the things that we use the most that are, are we're getting probably the, the, the most uh, bang for the buck are just the reports. Just yeah, I really to go in and just do ad hoc reports and, 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 and then create visualizations. Um, Elizabeth has this beautiful dashboard. Dashboard, unbelievable. That, that, um, that uh, renewals, uh, daily renewals, monthly renewals, all sorts yeah. of things like that. I took a first crack at it and just it looked horrible. Um, it had, it had information in it, but it just looked horrible. Um, but, um, a plus five was able to kind of take the requirements and, and, you know, just from, from the perspective of, of them actually, you know, working in our data all the time and working with us, um, as, as part of the team, they were able to kind of understand what we needed to see and what, what our, our, um, our, our leadership wanted to see, and they were able to give um, this really nice visualization to Elizabeth. So at any time, she could just open this dashboard and say, oh yeah, we got this and this, and this is what happened last month, and this is what happened yesterday. Um, the other thing is um, we've been able to, and just recently actually, we were able to work it out where um, one of the requests we had was from our constituents and our, and our uh, affiliates, they, he wanted to be able to see a daily view of how many people joined or renewed. And so we were able to give him that and send him his report to his mailbox like every morning. So he gets a, every morning he gets a report of who joined and renewed from the previous day. Um, uh, some of the other stuff, uh, the... Um, well, before you move off the dashboards, you know, I've actually seen where you guys have two different dashboards. One is the membership dashboard that you're talking about that does, like you mentioned, how many people renewed, um, how many how how they're about to expire, how they pay and all of that. But the other dashboard I find very interesting is um, your, what I would call like a housekeeping dashboard that talks about um, yeah. how many how many records do you have that don't have uh, email addresses or, um, yep. you know, uh, work addresses and all of that? And I thought that was, talk to us a little bit more about that dashboard and how you use sure. it. Yeah, so that was, that was really cool. Um, and we were asking, we were asking uh, a Plusify to do all this data cleanup. And what we were running into is just kind of, how do we keep track of it? How do we keep track of what's left? Um, and what, you know, how do we, how do I report to my leadership what, you know, what the damage is today, you know? Um, and so um, a plus five created this dashboard. So it basically shows like how many people don't have a, um, a home address, you know, how many people don't have, how many duplicates exist, um, where how many people have more than one, um, state affiliation or you know you know things like that and it's just little you know little weird data points that we um you know our our um our our um executive director likes to call it whack-a-mole which i hate i hate that term but um you know it all, he, i think he started doing that because he felt like we didn't know what was wrong and every time something would pop up, pop up we'd right. to handle it um but we we had we had ideas of what was going on, but we just didn't we didn't understand the 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 entire scope, you know. And so, creating that dashboard it it gave us a better view into the scope of of any data issues that we were still having. And you know, once we were able to to do that, it allowed us to put our arms around it and focus on it. And um, it was extremely helpful, and it still is because it it does allow us to see variations. Like we have a report that comes out every day. And it tells us how many people have signed up without a state. And so we know if that number starts to tick up, that something somebody has figured out how to get around 
all of the development work that we put into it. Right. It's like one it. a month or one every other month. Somehow they do it. Yeah. <laughs> and we catch them. Yep. Yep. What is your, uh, Mary Ruth has lots of great membership questions. Um, maybe Elizabeth, you can talk, walk us through um, how you go about um, getting, updating all of the member records. Did you do any type of campaign um, to reach outwards to, to verify information or is that a, just a natural process online? So we did do a little bit of a beefed up campaign, which kind of, um, you know, it, it was a combination of get ready for a new system and um, in the process of that, update your membership, your membership information now if you haven't gone in and, and done it in the past. And we've, we've got, as I mentioned, a very large um, variety of members. Some of them are retired. Some of them are not as tech savvy as others. And so we actually mailed postcards and put ads in our journals saying a couple months in advance that this change was coming. And please go in and update your membership information so that the correct information gets transferred over to the new database. I actually have no idea how many people did do that. Um, you know, hopefully at least a few, but the idea was really twofold, as I said, get them ready for it uh, and give us something that we could, we could point back if people said, you know, how come we weren't told about this? Well, <laughs> so in addition to emails, you know, we actually sent you uh, something in the mail. Um, and once they were in their portal in, the, in Fontiva, it's very easy for them to update their information. So when they do log in now in the process of joining or renewing or, or sorry, not joining, but renewing and or perhaps um, logging in so that they can look at one of their journals, they are prompted to, you know, look at their teaching levels and areas, see if there's any updates that need to be made and to make any address changes. And then Byron, can you talk a little bit about, I know we help you a lot with this in terms of when a member calls in, um, either calls in, emails, or does an online chat, uh, a little bit about how our help desk helps those agents update their information. Oh, sure. Um, so <clears throat> when, I, when I first came into the, into the company as a full-time employee, I, one of the things I realized right away was that we did not have a, a good way of recording any issues, um, the issues that people have. It was have. totally willy-nilly. Yep. Like, uh, you call on the phone, if nobody answers, um, you leave a message, they call you back, or you could send an email to this mailbox and then somebody goes to the mailbox and tries to, you know, tries to figure out what you need and get back to you at some time. So not that the people that were doing that weren't doing a great job and they were really working hard, but- the, They couldn't keep up. Yeah, they just yeah. could not keep up, it was overwhelming. So I implemented a um, I implemented Zendesk, um, which is basically a, you know it's a help desk system um, and a service desk system, and it also has the ability to um, to be a phone system. So everybody that's in Zendesk can have um, the ability to use to to take incoming calls, and so I direct all the calls for member services to the Zendesk system. And we also got a, um, uh, a, a license for another uh, piece of it called chat, which allows us to put a chat bubble on the, on the web page, which also kind of shows where people are going on the web page because it's, it's persistent. So it shows you where people are sitting on the web page and whether or not they're just kind of looking at different places. And it, it gives you a lot of really cool visualizations about what's happening on your website. But um, those were the kind of the three different ways that, uh, two or three different ways that you could, you could get in touch with, with folks. And we had a plus of five folks manning Zendesk. So right. when someone would call, it would open a ticket. The plus of five, uh, person would, would answer the call. Um, and the person would say, I've got a problem. I can't do this, or I want to purchase a membership, but I can't do that. They would record all the information in the ticket. And then, you know, if they could help them, like for instance, if they just needed their password reset or something like that, then it's just done. If they want to renew their membership, it's done. Um, if they have a more serious problem, like, you know, I, I, I don't like the way your, um, I don't like the way your website looks and, and I want you to change it. And oh, by the way, I'm not getting a password reset and, I really hate you guys because you're not doing what I want you to do right now. 
<laughs> um, with educators, I'm sure they're not, you know, proofing your there, there, Those are few oh, and far between, but oh, that, that person, they find their way to Byron and me. <laughs> that, that, that person gets sent to Byron. Yeah. <laughs> so they can assign it's, that to me. Because they're also calling in about, you know, how, sh how do I teach virtually? What platform should I use? What standards are we using? What, what, how does copyright affect it if I'm teaching, you know, virtually? What songs can I use? So they're, they're also asking a lot of program questions and those have to get sent along to the regular staff. So the Aplesify team is, is really doing some great work figuring out, you know, who needs to answer these kinds of questions. Right. And there's, so, and, and, but more importantly, as Byron was saying, there's a record of it. So we can make sure that everybody gets answered. Right. And, and so that, that kind of helped us not let things fall through the cracks, which was a huge problem when we first, when we first started and because it was just so the volume and before we got with, uh, you know, the volume that we had before we um, signed up with the Plusify it was so large and just so overwhelming. There was no way we couldn't do anything. There was nothing we could do except answer the phones. That was it. Mm -hmm. I mean, and it was just, it was bad. But um, a Plusify allowed us to, to apply resources wherever we needed it. Yep. And, and they allowed us to kind of just turn up the faucet, you know, when, when the, the deluge was, was greatest, you know. And so we got, we moved, it, they allowed us to move from that firefighting position to the position of support and operations and you know yeah, and making progress improvement you know yeah and so that was that's the big big plus of you know what what they what they did for us and 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 the way that they worked with our internal systems now byron i gotta um kind of interject in here and say the it was great that you had zendesk um not only had did you have this platform but it also integrated with Salesforce yes. and what yes. um, it has allowed us to do is if someone calls in and needs help, we can actually do some of that verification, membership verification yes. uh, while we're on the phone with them or on the chat and, oh, before, you know, we, we've helped you, but can we take a few minutes just to make sure we've got your information Beautiful. correct? And that's been, I think has been helped a lot in cleaning up some of that data. The tickets okay. show right up in the person's membership record. So yeah. it's, uh, it's amazing. Yeah, we're yeah. running out of time. This is going very quickly. Um, uh, I do want to get into um, a little bit about um, messaging, but before we do, Jenny's got a great question here. Um, it says, uh, did you guys do implementation uh, through Fontiva? Did you have a third party help? We did implementation through Fontiva. Um, we, we, we investigated getting third party help and looking back on it, we probably should have. Yeah. But, we, were, uh, we were spread too thin. Yeah, we were just spread way too thin. And I think Fontiva's, their perspective is more that, you know, you have basically a, um, you have an internal IT team, you know, that can, can do a lot of things, can, can handle your data, um, can, can, can help you manipulate your data and get it into Fontiva. Um, they, they did have a lot of expertise on their side to help us with that, but, um, but it was, it was kind of, um, it was a last minute, it turned into a last minute thing because things came up that we just could not have anticipated. And somebody who knew more about implementing Fontiva than us, um, and, and, and actually working with Fontiva probably would have, would have helped things go a little smoother. Um, another question is, how long did you have Fontiva before um, we became buddies? Mm -hmm. right Nicely before put. I came on board. I think it was about four months because yeah. we went live in July and I know we were working together before, before the holidays. So yeah. and this was July of last year, just to make sure everybody right. knew. Yeah. yeah, right. So yeah, we, we went live in July and we, uh, you guys came, uh, Plus Five came on board in like the end of, end of October. I mean, we had been talking with you before that, but that's when I think it all started to be implemented. Okay. Um, Elizabeth, I want to ask you, I know um, with everything that's going on in the world right now and budgets being lean, and especially in the education industry, you've probably had to do a lot of changes to your membership structure, uh, if not structure your fees and um, just maybe how you go through the whole approach. What are some of the things that you've done mm. membership wise to, you know, to accommodate uh, your members? Well, you know, that's an interesting question 
Anu, because so far we haven't seen a huge um, issue. But what's happening is in-person events are starting to be canceled straight from this fall, straight through this spring. And I do think that's going to affect our membership. And so I worked with our um, executive board, our new president who came in in July, and staff on some messaging. It's, it, it's not messaging that I think is going to light the world on fire, but it is a message yeah. of we will get through this together. And the, what we've been trying to do is provide, we just ramped up our resources and, and mostly in the forms of, of webinars. And even though, I mean, here we are on a webinar, everybody's over webinared, but our teachers are watching these webinars in the thousands. They're, they're all about distance learning. They're all about how to teach music um, when you can't correct a child's fingers on an instrument or practice with their breathing or, or sing together. Um, and uh, so we've been trying to show our members that we are doing this to, so that they can get through this year and that they need to join together because it's a lot harder to get a music program back once it's been cut than it is to just hang on to it. Even if it's just hanging on by a little bit, you can build it back up. So um, we have uh, worked with our president to do um, a, an email and that, that included a video that she was, she's a very warm person and she was talking about that togetherness. And so far people seem to be responding to it very well. Um, but the, uh, the, I think our busiest renewal time is September, October. And so we'll know a lot better in about six weeks how we ended up doing. Uh, Elizabeth, I want to take the time to share this video because I think it's, um, it just, it's just a great way to share um, something that someone does in the association industry, just maybe perhaps give some ideas sure, to everyone. Thank you. Um, and I know everyone, this is, we're coming up on an hour here. We'll, we'll continue a little bit longer. I do uh, understand that if you do need to leave us, I uh, appreciate you joining us today. Uh, we'll be reaching out to see if you have any other questions or if we can help you out. I will be sure to share everyone's contact information. Um, and then Byron, after we show this video, if you're in case everybody wants to know, uh, after we share this video, Byron, I'd love to hear a little bit on the technical side, what you had to do, uh, anything, if anything, to accommodate some of the, you know, some of this new messaging and just what you've had to do recently. But let me play this video very quickly. Hello, I'm Mackie Spratley. I'm the president of the National Association for Music Education. As many of you are preparing to go back to school, maybe in the next few weeks or days, I just wanted to take a couple of moments to chat with you, one music educator to another. You know, this year will be like no other year before, and you will most likely experience days and moments that you feel very successful and then there will be times where you will feel very frustrated but i'm here today to encourage you to encourage you to do what you do best you know it's similar to those days when we were in the studio and our professor gave us a list of repertoire and we were so excited but on that list, there were always a few songs, a few pieces that would stretch us to no end. We thought we'd never get through it. We had to practice really hard. We had to isolate problems and, and work through those diligently. Well, I believe that this year will be another year of a stretch. It will be a stretch for us as music educators even as the field of music education. See, um, I believe you already have in you to do everything that you need to do this year. Because I believe that you are creative beings. You were born with the ability to take things and turn them upside down to make something absolutely wonderful out of it, to make something new to create something new, to create something out of nothing. I believe you are wired to seek opportunities, always to seek opportunities, 
to learn more for your own personal growth, as well as for your students to be able to do more for your students and to help them to learn more. Mm. And I certainly believe that you love music and that you understand how music is so important in a student's life. It is their life and ours as well. So I believe you got this. And I'm here to tell you that NAFME is in this with you. You are, you are never alone. And as your national organization, I want you to know that we will continue to provide the best resources, webinars and seminars and everything that we can to help you get through this year as a success as a success we want you to do well we know you can do well and as you try to navigate these uncharted waters keep coming back to NAFME because NAFME is here to help you I want you to be brave be strong and believe you are not in this alone remember I am NAFME. You are NAFME. We all are NAFME. I wish you the very best this year. God bless. So Elizabeth, I, this is very empowering, very encouraging. Very you can tell she's a choral director. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it has that emotion. So now you've got the messaging down pat. You, you, you've sent that Hello, out. Welcome to the National oh, Association for Music. Um, you sent that information out, um, got the video. So now, Byron, on the AMS side, what did you have to do um, behind the scenes to make sure you were ready to, you know, take in, you know, people that still wanted to be engaged? And um, You know, the, the funny thing is, I think we've been working on it for so long now. I think <laughs> we're pretty ready. Yeah, yeah. It's ready. <laughs> you know, um, we we anticipated that this was going to be like a really busy year um you know like before the COVID thing <laughs> because last year when when we were at this point we were just overwhelmed completely yeah. and um our entire uh july was was missed basically because we didn't we didn't we shut our system down for the whole month pretty much and um so we tried our best to ready the system for whatever could hit it this year. Um, so we're ready. I mean, you know, we, um, we're making some minor changes to, um, to how we, um, how we do, um, uh, shipping logistics and things like that. But other than that, um, for the most part, we, we pretty much got everything, everything down. Our data is pretty clean right now. Um, not to say we don't have some issues, you know, we have a few issues with password resets and partner portals and things like that, um, that, you know, we're working through, but I mean, I'm, I'm pretty confident we're, we're, we're in good shape. Oh God. If, uh, let's see here. Um, so Mary Roth, we'll take this last question and then we'll kind of wrap it up for, for today. Mary Roth asks, um, how were you able to shut down systems for a month? That's we took it um, in, that was one of the reasons for July, Mary. Historically, our very, very slowest month by a mile. Um, just not a lot of people using the system to join or renew because they're, they're taking their hard-earned summer vacation. Um, but Byron worked with Fontiva to, or with our previous AMS to um, make it inaccessible so that people couldn't go into the old system. And that was kind of the point of the... Uh, postcard and we put notices up on the website saying between July 1st and July 24th, you wouldn't, you, you're not going to be able to join or renew. So try to do it before then, or you have to wait till, and then until July 24th or whatever it was. And at that point, they were the first people to go into Fontiva. Great. Does anyone have very quiet while the system was <laughs> shut down? <laughs> yeah, that's extremely quiet. Well, that's great. Well, Elizabeth Byron, thank you so much for spending the time with us today. Any parting words of wisdom for us? Time, test, 
and reasonable expectations. <laughs> yes, I'll ditto, ditto that. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Uh, everyone, thank you for staying with us this long. Uh, we do appreciate it. If you, there are any questions that you have for Elizabeth Byron or for a Plusify, even if it's technical, I'll make sure she could get into the right hands to get back to you. But thank you. This has been a webinar by a Plusify with uh, Elizabeth Lasco and Byron Smith with the National Association for Music Educators. Thank you for joining us. <laughs>